at the very, very top of the sort of hierarchy is the United States Supreme Court, right? There are nine judges, but we call them justices on the Supreme Court of the United States. The number of justices is actually determined by Congress. Congress determines how many justices there are. And that's why periodically you'll hear arguments um, about why the size of the court should be increased or decreased. For example, as of today, the, the, this recording, um, it's May of 2022. Right now, there are six, um, six conservative justices on the Supreme Court three liberal judges. I think it's that's a safe assessment. And so um, it's at times like this that uh, what liberals in this case will do is they'll argue that if they get control of the Senate and there's a Democratic president, they should increase the size of the Supreme Court, add some additional judges that are more reflective of their point of view. So periodically throughout your life you're going to hear debates about what of the supreme court the size of the supreme court should be increased or decreased it's usually the party with the fewest number of justices that is talking about increasing the courts i'm not going to weigh in one way or another on this other than to say that um the whole point of the maintain the Supreme, the Supreme Court is supposed to, to provide some stability in our system. And so if the parties change the size of the courts to match their own preferences, that might fundamentally alter the nature of the Supreme Court. So that might be problematic. At the same time, um, right now, like I say, there are of the nine justices, there are six that are um, conservative, three that are liberal, the country is really divided 50-50. And so the makeup of the court is very different than the makeup of the country as a whole. And so there are people who say that's when it might be wise to increase the, 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 um, the, the size of the court. And I'll let you make that determination on yourself, whether or not you think that warrants changing the court, and whether that sets a bad precedence for what does the next party do when they when they come in power. If the liberals, if Democrats change it and make it larger because um, they're in power now, then do the Republicans do the same thing? By the way, you can't reduce the size of the Supreme Court. They, somebody would have to be impeached or removed in order to change the composition. But leave, don't worry about that for the purposes of the exam. The justices are nominated by the president and they're confirmed by the Senate as with most nominations. Um, it, uh, it requires a majority vote in the Senate to confirm Supreme Court justices. It is again a lifetime appointment um, unless a judge either retires, dies, resigns, something else, um, uh, and or or there in theory could be removed from office. They could be impeached and removed, but that has never happened. The head of the Supreme Court is the Chief Justice. The, the, the Chief Justice is nominated by the President, confirmed by the Senate, using the same set of rules. The last time there was an opening on the Supreme Court for the Chief Justice, what happened was the sitting Chief Justice at the time, William Rehnquist, um, I believe he passed away. In any case, the President at the time, President Bush, brought in a new justice and nominated him to be chief justice. And so he went from not being on the court to being the chief justice of the Supreme Court. Sometimes what the, uh, if the chief justice dies, what the president will do will elevate somebody who's already on the court to be chief justice and then nominate somebody to replace them. You have the chief justice and then you have associate justices. And so that's the makeup of the court. Now, the reason the courts are so important in our political system is because they have the power of judicial review. 
And judicial review is an extraordinary power. It, the courts have the ability to declare a law or an action by the government unconstitutional. And what that means when they say it's unconstitutional is you can't do it. Now, let's think about that for a sec. So the court, the Congress could pass a law. It could be supported by everybody in Congress, all 435 members of the House, all 100 members of the Senate. The president could say, I like this, and sign it into law. Every one of our federal elected, elected officials could say, this is a good idea. And the Supreme Court could say, yeah, but we think it violates the Constitution, and boom, it would be gone. That is the power of judicial review. And there's nobody above the Supreme Court. Like, there's nobody who, who can say, no, you can't do that. The president might disagree. No, that's con that law is con constitutional. Doesn't matter. There's no appeal of a Supreme Court decision. And that's why the power of judicial review is very important. So I want to explore that a little bit. But I want to also, after we talk about judicial review, um, also I want to point out, and I'll tell you ahead of time, there are some checks on the courts, but they're a little bit more nuanced, and we'll go over that. But first, let's talk about the power of judicial review. The most interesting thing that you should know about the power of judicial review is it's not mentioned anywhere in the Constitution. There's nowhere in the Constitution that gives the Supreme Court the authority to just declare laws or governmental actions unconstitutional. In a very famous court case, early in the development of the Republic, a case called Marbury versus Madison, and I'm not going to go into the details of this case, the court basically took this power upon itself. The, something happened, again, I'm not going to go to the details, something happened, and the president objected, and the courts listened to the case, and in agreeing with the president at the time, in this case it was Thomas Jefferson, the court agreed with the president in a kind of roundabout way, but in doing so said that this law that was passed was unconstitutional, and everybody was like, they can do that? Well, they did it. And everybody accepted the decision. Um, it helped that the decision favored what the president wanted. But in any case, they just declared this power among, upon themselves. And it's been recognized as a power ever since. And not just a power that the Supreme Court has, a power that every court has. So all the U.S. district courts, they can declare laws unconstitutional. The courts of appeals, they can declare laws unconstitutional. Even state courts can do this. Power of judicial review is a tremendous power. So let me give you an example of judicial review um, and how this would work. I'm going to just give you a very famous court case, Texas versus Johnson. This is decided in 1989. Um, these are the facts of the case. Mr. Johnson was in Texas. That's why it's Texas versus Johnson. It was the state of Texas against Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson was in Texas to um, protest the Republican National Convention. Apparently, there was something about the Republican Party that he didn't like, and so he went there to protest. And as part of his protest, what Mr. Johnson did is he burned an American flag. Now, before I go on with the court case, you protest any way you want to. Do what If you're upset about something, you can protest in any way you want to that's peaceful. Um, one of the things I would recommend is that you not burn an American flag. And the reason why is that there have been countless numbers of times in our history where enemies, true enemies of the United States, what they'll do is they'll get in a circle and they'll burn American flags. And so if you burn an American flag, for many people, you're going to just activate memories of when people who are truly hostile to this country 
um, burned American flags. Mr. Johnson, he wasn't an enemy of the country. I think what he was trying to say is this is what, in this case, the Republicans, this is what the Republican Party is doing to the United States. And he burns an American flag. So I'm not questioning his intent and his motives. I'm just saying, I just don't think strategically it's a good thing to do. But let's move on. Um, Texas had a law that prohibited just desecrating the American flag. I mean, whether you stomp on it, whether you, you know, whatever you do, you can't desecrate the American flag. So when Mr. Johnson burned the American flag, he was arrested. And he, and he said, this is unconstitutional. My arrest was unconstitutional. It violated my freedom of speech. I am able to express my views about the government. The First Amendment protects that. In this case, the argument was burning an American flag is an example of symbolic speech. And so he argued that this law in Texas violated his constitutional rights. Now, as offensive as you may find burning an American flag, the court said, you know what, Mr. Johnson's right. This law is unconstitutional. It violates the First Amendment, his First Amendment rights. Now, there were 48 states that had laws just like the one in Texas. When the court ruled that the Texas law was unconstitutional, not only did it wipe the Texas law off the books, meaning nobody could be arrested for desecrating the American flag uh, ever again, but in those 48 other states, it also wiped those laws off the books too. That's the power of judicial review, a tremendous power. And so that's why judicial review is such an important thing to know about and to understand, because that's where the power of the courts come in. Now, as I said before, this recording is being done in May of 2022. The court is about to render a decision in June about Roe versus Wade. Now, in Roe versus Wade, what happened was the court upheld um, a, a woman's right to have an abortion in the first trimester. Mississippi passed a law that restricted abortion. And so there was a lawsuit that was brought and the courts were going to decide um, whether or not, and this is what we'll find out in June, um, depending on when you watch this, you'll know the outcome. The courts will decide whether or not that law, either that law violates the Constitution as, as they had previously decided, or if the previous decision was wrong, in which case they're going to decide using their power that the Texas, that the Mississippi law is fine and they're going to say Roe v. Wade, the previous decision, doesn't apply any longer and that the states get to set their own rules for when abortions are going to be allowed. Once again, this isn't exactly judicial review, but it speaks to the power of the courts and which is why the courts are so important. Now, the last thing I want to talk about in this section is the power that the courts have to enforce its rulings. How does the Supreme Court enforce its rulings? Well, the truth is the courts have no mechanism to enforce their rulings. The Supreme Court certainly doesn't. And so typically they rely on the president to carry out the laws. They rely on law enforcement officials to um, carry out the laws at the state level. But there's nothing that the court has within its power that can actually compel anybody to follow its rulings, but everybody does. This is part of democracy that's kind of hard to understand. Part of the reason that democracy works is because everybody agrees on certain norms or rules that we follow. They're like guardrails. And the way democracy works is that people understand where those guardrails are and they oh, we all agree sort of collectively, we're gonna follow these rules. Um, but the courts are always aware that they could just be 
they're the especially the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is always aware that its rulings could be ignored and there's nothing it could do. Okay, so with that, we're going to move on to the next video where we'll talk about, given how much power the courts have, how to how are the courts restrained? What are the checks and balances in our system? And I'll get that into the next video.